Thanks so much for coming and attending our panel about Syria, dialogue on the Syrian crisis. Uh, my name is Yerder McElroy. I'm a Juhan Fellow. And I'm Carrie Bine, another one of the Juhan Fellows. So tonight we'll hear about, from experts about the historical and political background of the conflict in Syria, as well as from a representative of an NGO who's helping those affected by the crisis. This discussion is even more relevant after the events of last Friday and the backlash experienced by refugees as a result. Our hope is that through tonight's dialogue, it becomes clear that this issue is drastically affecting the lives of people and that we need to come to the aid of those people. We would like to read some remarks from Julie Mugal, Assistant Director of the Center for Faith and Public Life, Director of Fairfield's Duhan Program, who did so much to coordinate this event but is unfortunately unable to be here tonight. I would like to welcome everyone to this panel which wraps up Juhan's Humanitarian Action Week at Fairfield University. Each year, Juhan, the Jesuit University's Action Network, sets aside this week in November to host events in many of our 28 campuses in the U.S. and our colleges and universities across the world to support those in need and advocate for heightened awareness and action regarding humanitarian crises. Unfortunately, this is our third awareness and action this is our third year in a row that we are hosting a panel on Syria. As the terrible tragedy continues to unfold in Syria, its neighboring countries, and across <coughs> Europe. As many of you know, we have a dynamic Juhan student group here at Fairfield who recently starred in a Juhan video, which we would like to show now. Juhan is the Jesuit University's Humanitarian Action Network. Since 2006, students from a growing number of Juhan clubs from Jesuit colleges and universities around the world have worked together to create awareness of humanitarian issues and serve people and communities in need, at home and abroad. Juhan prepares us for careers in humanitarian action and to be global citizens. Together, we effectively coordinate responses to humanitarian crises and take action on humanitarian concerns related to global development. Working with organizations like Save the Children, the Red Cross, Catholic Relief Services, AmeriCares, and Jesuit Relief Services, we've helped rebuild communities after natural disasters, trained students and staff to be first responders, and participated in immersive disaster relief field training exercises. During alternative spring breaks, we've worked in Joplin, Missouri, supporting the recovery efforts after devastating tornadoes. And in Atlanta, Georgia, we work with the International Rescue Committee, helping recent refugees start new lives. We educate our campuses on global humanitarian issues, such as Syrian refugee crisis, fundraise for global causes like earthquake relief for Nepal, and attend conferences and international gatherings as vocal advocates for pressing humanitarian concerns. Every two years, Juhan clubs meet at our student leadership conference, where we learn from each other, share ideas, and create strategies to increase our positive impact on the world. Join us by starting a Juhan club on your campus. Visit us at juhanonline.org. Juhan, stronger together. I would also like to thank our wonderful Juhan student fellows, Deirdre McElroy and Carrie Bine, who both work so hard to ensure that our humanitarian work touches our students on campus. I also would like to extend an extra special thanks to Deirdre, who was the driving force in putting yesterday's very successful refugee camp simulation event together and in organizing tonight's panel. It is truly thanks to her efforts in spearheading these events that so many students have a better understanding of the situation in Syria and that, tri and that the trials that millions face as refugees. One final thank you to the faculty who will speak tonight and to my wonderful former colleague Wendy from Save the Children for their participation this evening. Now before we begin, we'd like to have a moment of silence for those who lost their lives or were impacted by the terrorist attacks that took place um, in Paris and all over uh, the globe on Friday. Thank you. Our first panelist is Marcy Patton, Professor of Politics. Thank you. 
Um, I'm just going to give you a few pieces of information um, about Syria, and then I want to talk about um, the uh, Syrian borders and uh, sort of how some of the different uh, countries in the Middle East um, are involved um, in the issue. Uh, but to begin with, um, I'd like to sort of say that um, I think there are the three most alarming issues we have that pertain to the Syrian crisis today are first the growing militarization of the region and of the conflict. And I think Professor McFadden is also gonna be speaking to this issue when he talks about Russia. Um, another significant issue is the issue of refugees and uh, internally displaced uh, people or internally displaced persons. Uh, now uh, the number of people who uh, are either displaced or have left Syria uh, are roughly 50% of the Syrian population before this conflict began. Uh, and third, um, the uh, other uh, alarming development is uh, ISIS and the uh, fractious debate uh, in Washington about uh, over what to do about ISIS and uh, in light of the uh, attacks that took place um, in Paris, uh, we seem to be uh, having a growing uh, momentum for a further uh, militarization of the region. So let me give you a little bit of facts about Syria. It's, it's a nice map up here. Um, it's a territory that's roughly the size of North Dakota. Um, it's a little less than half the size of Iraq. Uh, and it is split by two major cleavages. So the first cleavage is ethnicity. Uh, roughly 90% uh, of the population are, are ethnically Arab. About 9% are ethnically Kurdish, which means it's a different ethnicity, different language. And uh, just under 1% uh, are the Armenians, uh, Jews, and the various uh, Christian groups like the Yazidis. Um, the, uh, uh, sorry, not the Yazidis, uh, they come in the second category. The second category that divides Syria is a category of religion. Um, about 10% of the population um, is Christian. 90% uh, of the population is Muslim. However, uh, increasingly this conflict has become uh, sectarianized, uh, which means that the conflict uh, has been increasingly centered on uh, rivalry between uh, Sunni groups and Shiite groups. Uh, and uh, of the Muslims in Syria, about 74% uh, are Sunni and about 16% are Alawite, which is a sect sort of close to um, Shiism. Uh, it's also important to note that all of these ethno-religious groups have lived in the region for centuries under Ottoman rule without running into any significant sectarian problems. So this is not a problem that's of long historical vintage. This is a problem that's been manufactured fairly recently, uh, particularly since uh, the Arab uprising in 2011. Uh, and that's when events uh, began to unfold in Syria when in 2011, there were a, a group of youth in uh, a southern city of Syria that uh, uh, did, wrote graffiti on the walls and uh, they were arrested by security forces and uh, a few days later their parents couldn't find anything out about them and a few days later their bodies were uh, dumped in the road and showed signs of torture. And uh, this led the uh, families of the community to uh, kind of organize a big demonstration protest, and that protest kind of snowballed across Syria without there being any organization between the various villages. There was no leadership. This was spontaneous outbreaks um, across uh, the region, and largely because uh, they have lived under an authoritarian regime uh, for, uh, for a number of decades. So um, I want to point out the, uh, the borders that uh, Syria has here. So it's hard to do it and not turn around. Uh, on the north, um, Syria has a border uh, with Turkey. Uh, Turkey's involvement in this conflict um, uh, plays out two ways. Uh, one, uh, early on, and perhaps to some extent still ongoing, uh, Turkey provided um, a lot of material support um, to ISIS. Uh, for two reasons. One, uh, Turkey is very anti-Assad. Uh, and two, uh, because ISIS uh, was, is a Sunni group uh, and the Turkish uh, government uh, 
uh, Sunni in character. They felt some kind of uh, brotherhood with uh, the ISIS group, and so um, they uh, uh, funneled supplies to uh, ISIS. Um, this has come back to uh, bite them uh, since uh, ISIS did a horrific bombing um, in Ankara uh, not that long ago. And uh, uh, at that point, Turkey agreed uh, that it would cooperate with the United States in uh, opposing ISIS, and it proceeded to carry out a number of bombing missions um, in Syria. However, uh, they didn't bomb a single ISIS target. Instead, uh, they bombed Kurdish groups, because Turkey is afraid that the Syrian Kurds will establish a separate state, an autonomous region, in uh, northern Syria along the borders of Turkey, and that might be some motivation for Turkish Kurds as well as Iraqi Kurds to also uh, declare uh, independent statehood. Uh, so uh, unfortunately for uh, the position the United States has taken, it's kind of caught in the middle here, but um, the uh, uh, Kurds have been the best fighting force uh, against uh, ISIS uh, so far. So the fact that Turkey is bombing ISIS while the United States wants to support ISIS, uh, I mean, the Turkey is bombing the Kurds and, and so on, you get the picture. It's very uh, co problematic. Um, another border here is uh, this, uh, very significant, obviously, is the border with um, Iraq. Uh, this uh, is significant uh, one because um, ISIS controls territory uh, both um, in Syria uh, and in Iraq. Uh, two, uh, because the origins of ISIS can be traced back to uh, the aftermath of the US uh, invasion. Uh, in uh, 2003, uh, and um, specifically uh, when uh, the leader of the American Coalition Provisional Authority, Paul Bremer, uh, decided to, on a policy of debathification, uh, which meant that um, everybody who was a member of the Ba'ath Party, which included anybody who wanted to have a job, in Iraq uh, was immediately fired uh, from their uh, positions and were left without pensions, salary, nothing. And uh, a very large chunk of those who were uh, fired were uh, military officers in the Iraqi army. Uh, and so uh, the fact that ISIS has some uh, good uh, strategic um, capabilities uh, can be attributed to the fact that um, these uh, Sunni uh, military officers um, have uh, joined forces with ISIS. Not because they believe in ISIS, but because uh, they um, are fighting for uh, their own uh, space, so to speak. Uh, and that's because the government of uh, Iraq, uh, since the elections uh, took place, after the Americans, when the Americans left, uh, the government in Iraq is dominated by uh, Shiites. Uh, Shiites have always been uh, the majority sect in the country. However, uh, for centuries, including Ottoman period, uh, the Sunnis uh, governed, uh, and Saddam Hussein was a Sunni. So uh, there's a bit of sort of revenge politics going on uh, where the Sunnis, who were the, the majority in number over the years, were treated as a lesser group compared to the minority Sunnis. Uh, and so you now have a Shiite government uh, that um, is uh, quite divided. Uh, the current uh, prime minister of Iraq, uh, al-Badi, uh, very much wants to be pro-United uh, States, uh, but um, his own government is uh, significantly divided, uh, not only internally, but also against him. Uh, and the groups that are against him uh, are pro-Iran. Um, uh, Iran is another uh, country that we should mention in terms of the borders uh, here. Um, Iran, people have heard a lot about it because of the nuclear agreement. Um, Iran is uh, a, a majority a Shiite country. Um, and I think the most important thing about um, Iran and the reason for its involvement in the region is that uh, since the United States um, eliminated uh, Saddam in the region, uh, that left only one strong regional power uh, in the Middle East, and that was Iran. So Iran is clearly uh, trying to basically captain the regional ship of the Middle East uh, and assert itself as a regional uh, hegemon. Uh, the um, other uh, borders here that we see, um, borders with Jordan and with Lebanon, 
there are, uh, these two countries um, are not taking part in significant ways in this conflict, but they are significant uh, repositories of, uh, there are significant numbers of refugees in both countries. Uh, maybe 40% uh, of the Syrian refugees have fled to Lebanon. I'm sure these numbers are going to be updated. Um, mine are a little old. Uh, Jordan, about 20%. Um, a small percentage have fled to Iraq because Iraq's not exactly a stable place to flee to. So if you're fleeing to Iraq, you're really desperate. And uh, about a third um, have fled uh, to uh, Syria. Uh, it's also important to note that um, Europe, uh, in terms of these numbers, has taken, I would say, no more than 5% of the total refugees, uh, Syrian refugees. So although it's all over the headlines, refugees, 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 and the United States has taken less than 1%. Uh, so in terms of uh, humanitarian response, um, the United States and uh, Europe really should be ashamed of themselves. Um, the uh, last country I want to mention is Saudi Arabia because um, at one level this conflict is about uh, countries and groups that want to uh, depose the uh, ruler of Syria, uh, Bashar Assad. And so you have pro-Assad groups and anti-Assad groups that are fighting one another. Uh, at another level, this conflict is a war between um, Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a, a Sunni country. It's uh, adamantly opposed uh, to what it sees as uh, Iranian expansion or Iranian involvement in the region. That's why uh, Saudi Arabia has sent forces into uh, Yemen, because it has claimed that um, Iran has been sending uh, uh, assistance to uh, the uh, fighters, uh, the, the Houthi fighters in uh, Yemen, although there's absolutely no evidence um, to support this claim. Uh, and uh, lastly, I would say about Saudi Arabia is that um, recently the United States um, has uh, just signed a arms deal uh, with Saudi Arabia for to sell the Saudis one billion dollars worth of armaments. This is the largest arms sale in the history of the world. So if we are expecting to see a reduction of militarization in the region, if we're expecting to see a reduction in problems with ISIS, if we're expecting to see a reduction in the problem of refugees, uh, then we're not being realistic about the Middle East. Our second panelist is Sylvia Marsan Sackley, Assistant Professor of History. Thank you for that um, context. Um, I, uh, two years ago, when I first participated in this panel, I had one conclusion, that the Syrian, comp uh, uh, as you heard, um, the Syrian conflict is complex and multi-layered with diverse regional, local, and transnational powers, each with its own competing interest, and that the resolution, if there was even a political will to, Im to implement it, would be long and bloody. This was before ISIL or ISIS became a player, and now it seems that ISIL is the hub around which competitors realign themselves. So uh, my part of the presentation is gonna focus on ISIS or ISIL. It's the same, uh, it's a different, uh, whether you emphasize the Levant or you emphasize the Arabic word, which is Shem, and this is where the S comes from. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history, um, which uh, Professor Patton already kind of framed for you. Uh, mobilization, uh, what are some of the reasons for mobilization, uh, and, how kind of, and how it looks on the ground. Um, I've been watching a lot of alternative um, news sources, um, a lot of uh, people who are journalists who have spent significant time documenting what it's like on the ground um, in the region. Uh, so I'll be giving you my, my impressions of that. There are believed to be as many as one, if you think that the, the great powers that are uh, you know, operating here that, uh, are numerous and multi-layered, uh, you should see the opposition. Um, there are believed to be as many as 1,000 armed opposition groups in Syria, commanding an estimated 100,000 fighters. Many of the groups are small and operate on a local level. I mean, we only hear about ISIS, but uh, uh, ISIS really only has uh, from 3,000 to 5,000 you know, armed soldiers that they can command. 
Uh, so it's not a small, it's not a large uh, army by any means. Um, the groups are operated, they, they, small, they operate on a local level and a number have emerged as powerful forces with affiliates across the country or formed alliances with other groups that share a similar agenda. Uh, you have a really messy on the ground reality. There are a lot of divisions on the battlefield, there's a lot of infighting among the groups and the populations are caught in the middle. The refugees that you see fleeing uh, across Europe are the ones who can afford the passage uh, with the smugglers so they are the ones that are actually well off. The poor are stuck and vulnerable and caught in the middle, and they are submitting to ISIS through fear, or they uh, sometimes join in despair, hoping for some sort of protection or security on the ground um, for the aerial bombardment um, that is directed ostensibly at ISIS, but actually the bombs are not that smart and they kill innocent civilians in the process. We never hear about that either. When the numbers dwindle in one group, the groups realign. And so this fluid set of alliances creates the enemy of enemies. The enemy of the enemies, my friend. Um, and uh, as is also uh, paradoxically the case with the great powers, um, where we now find Russia affiliated uh, uh, with France and the US. Um, OK, so uh, when did they appear on the scene? Uh, and what does ISIS, uh, so ISIS is about um, the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq. Right, so there's a, um, an affiliation with, uh, with the Iraqi um, situation, and as Dr. Patton said, um, this is really, the, the roots of this are in the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. So the U.S. invades Iraq, 2003, it takes six weeks to topple Saddam Hussein, but the U.S. stays as an occupation force until 2011. Um, you have uh, in there um, the Abu Ghraib um, scandal, of uh, prisoners, the horrific abuse of detainees. Um, and that when that camp closed, um, you had another camp near the Kuwaiti border called Camp Buka. And this was in use from 2003 to 2009. And this is where, um, you know, Al Jazeera, uh, the Arabic news channel, uh, claims that it was paradise compared to Abu Ghraib. Uh, prisoners got an education, they got exercise, they got vocational training and health care. Um, but it was also a place where they formed networks. So this is where detainees who were part of the Ba'athist regime, uh, generals, uh, formed alliances with the jihadis. Um, and it was in Camp Buka. So the incubation of ISIS was in these camps, right? Um, particularly that camp. Uh, from 2004 to 2006, you had Al-Qaeda in Iraq formed. It wasn't formed before. Uh, before. I mean, we were told that one of the reasons that, um, you know, for the Iraq war was because Al-Qaeda uh, was, was there um, and that they had something to do with the 9-11 attacks. And, and in fact, you know, most people believe that even though there was no evidence for it. Um, so you had in there a split. Uh, Al-Qaeda did become active in Iraq as a result of the U.S. invasion. Um, so from 2004 and 2006, you had a Jordanian named Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. Um, and he was declaring, um, you know, um, kind of the Sunni uh, uh, caliphate almost, um, the Islamic State, right? Um, 2006 to 2013, uh, they renamed themselves um, the Islamic State of Iraq. Uh, by that time, they had reaped the benefits of the, um, of the revolt in Syria uh, that shares, as Dr. Patton said, a long border. Um, and then there was um, the Maliki regime, uh, which was extremely sectarian, and they were, uh, it was in power from 2006 to just 2014. Um, so the Sunnis felt completely disenfranchised. Um, and then joined up in, these, um, in this organization. You had the Islamic State of Iraq and Al Shem. Al Shem is the Arabic word for uh, Greater Syria, which includes um, uh, the Levant, Greater uh, Syria, uh, what is now Israel, um, and, um, and, and so that was uh, that. And then there's the Caliphate that was declared from 2014 to the present. By the way, the Caliph, uh, uh, El Baghdadi, was also a member uh, of that Camp Buka. Uh, contingent, um, and actually uh, used to teach uh, Islamic theology there, right? Um, so the ideology is jihadi Salafism, 
which, um, what does that mean? Uh, it has this very strict, and among the jihadis, uh, uh, it is even hardline. Uh, ISIS is even extreme, uh, considered hardline by Al-Qaeda. Uh, and in fact, Al-Qaeda disowned them. So you know, you're really talking about the extreme of the extreme. Um, the uh, so uh, Salafism is about, and you know we can go into that later. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's principled on the on the idea of the oneness uh, uh, of uh, of God. And so it's very puritanical. Um, there, the and paradoxically, the nerve cent, uh, the nerve center of um, of Salafi ideology, uh, Salafi Wahhabism, is in Saudi Arabia, um, and where the scholar Ibn Taymiyyah has an intellectual home. Um, okay, so the, um, how do they rule? Um, so ISIS rules by, rules by fear and coercion, uh, but it also rec uh, gives recruits uh, the promise of security. Uh, oftentimes they build alliances with local tribes. Um, so I've seen this actually play out in videos, you know, um, where uh, tribes, uh, you know, in order to get security, people will, locals will marry off their daughters. Um, to ISIS um, leaders because they're perceived as strongmen because they're fully armed. Um, a lot of these arms have been taken from the Iraqi army, uh, uh, particularly in 2014 when there was an encounter. Um, and, the, and the Iraqi army that we spent so long to try and um, bolster and, and train uh, melted into thin air uh, and ran and left their equipment for ISIS to, to take. Um, so um, it had no legitimacy whatsoever. Um, okay, um, you also have, it's interesting because although, I mean, it's not really a state, uh, it controls territory. Uh, and um, you also have, you know, within it tries to um, kind of settle, set up an, an order. Uh, they have courts, that local courts. Um, uh, they now control an area the size of Jordan, uh, but you have uh, disagreement with the, within scholars that um, among the scholars who say, you know, some people say, well, you know, they control uh, millions of people in these borders or that, these, that this territory is actually empty desert. Um, so there's not really m many people to control. Um, there are a lot of jihadis coming from different places to fight and join in the struggle. Uh, Chechnya, uh, you have all over the Maghreb, uh, Tunisia, the home of the Arab Spring, has sent 3,000 um, known jihadis. Um, so, um, you know, you wonder, um, how do they finance their, um, their operations? Uh, one of the things is, um, you know, you have two oil producing states there. Uh, Iraq is the second uh, lar largest oil producer after Saudi Arabia. Um, and you have pipelines that go through the territory. So they can siphon off the oil, the crude oil, and sell it on the black market. Uh, they sell, uh, they have, uh, they've so, uh, sold antiquities. Um, you have the, some of the oldest cities in the world with all of their treasures um, are there, and so uh, they sell it on the black market. Um, you have taxes that are imposed on locals, on local populations that are extracted for security. Um, there's also this talk in the establishment of the Isla so-called Islamic State uh, taxing relig non-Muslim religious minorities um, to kind of um, uh, echo or kind of mirror uh, the jizya tax um, that was um, common when there was an Islamic empire um, around um, in that region. And then uh, there's also ransom money for captives. Uh, they're known to kidnap people uh, before they kill them, and then they try and uh, attempt to negotiate and get price, uh, a head price, before they actually um, uh, behead people. Uh, and then there are donations. There are private donors donating. Um, so uh, the question is, you know, who are the buyers? Um, because, you know, yes, they can sell the oil, but they have, a, they have buyers. They have local buyers. Um, and, you know, some analysts believe um, that even Assad... Is a, is a buyer, if you can believe that. Uh, this is how contradictory it gets, of ISIS uh, oil uh, that's being sold. Um, and Turkey uh, uh, is also a buyer of, because this is cheap oil. Um, okay, uh, people have been singling out Islam as, you know, as kind of like, um, you know, that, that, that this is actually a battle for the soul of Islam. Uh, but Islam doesn't live in a vacuum. And you cannot battle for the soul of Islam without also tackling um, 
uh, Western imperialism um, and, and warmongering. Um, we, so regardless, um, you know, whether we have boots on the ground or not, we are a player in the, in the Syrian civil war. Uh, the beheading of two American journalists was, um, was marketed here, uh, and I'll use that word, um, as an attack on the American people, not on individual journalists. Um, we cheer uh, when, um, you know, when uh, some people get killed and when our allies, uh, and then we decry when um, allies um, uh, get killed. Uh, Islam plays a part, but not a necessary, but not, it, but it's not necessarily in the rigid Salafi form demanded by the leadership of the Islamic State. Um, we are really focused on ideology um, and the supposedly Islamic religious dimension, and we don't focus enough on the political, social, um, and economic dimensions um, of the small number of people who actually join or support such groups. Um, so, in the mind, so what does what does the group promise? Why why do people why does it have a recruiting ground? Um, so, one of the things it promises is to overturn um, the corrupt political systems. Uh, and offer a new life in an Islamic state. Uh, and it offers a utopian vision of a caliphate that would protect all Muslims and, 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 and provide them with a decent life, if you can believe that, right? Um, bombing by outside powers creates the impression that they are under attack as a member of a state or a Muslim and not as ISIS. So this is also a, a really uh, important ideological recruiting ground. Um, in some cases, the assaults against ISIL reinforce that um, re reinforce really one of its main attractions, and that is the sense among Sunni Muslims that their religion is under attack and must be defended, uh, and only ISIL and similar groups uh, are, are ready to defend them. Uh, military. This is why the military option is not going to work. Uh, military military attacks against a Muslim Muslim majority states such as Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Somalia. Yemen, and Libya create, just to name a few, uh, create new zones of anarchy. And this is, the zones of anarchy in the Middle East are the recruiting ground for ISIL, for groups like ISIL and, and Al-Qaeda. Um, so why do they join? Uh, so one of the uh, really um, interesting things that I've read um, about why they join um, is a piece by Rami Khoury. Who is, um, who is a, a Lebanese journalist. Uh, one of the things is to overcome, uh, so I'm summarizing here, uh, over sun, overcome Sunni victimhood and the perception that the Shias and foreign powers now dominate the Middle East, as Dr. Patton um, described that. They want to live in a society that practices true Islamic values, such as justice and security, the rule of law and citizenship. Um, Righteousness and good governance um, that is often absent in Arab Islamic lands uh, with nation states ruled by dictators. So this is where the goals of, you know, it can appeal to goals of, you know, the failed, revo uh, in their mind, the failed revolts of uh, the Arab Spring. Um, they want to build an Islamic state and expand uh, the caliphate, which are necessary for a kind of millenarian promise. Um, there's a, there's a deep-seated feeling uh, that the end of times is near, that the Redeemer or the Mahdi, uh, this messianic figure, uh, is coming uh, and will usher in this uh, permanent peace and justice. But there's, actual, but there's also this nihilism. Um, you know, nihilism meaning that they have no hope. Um, they've, been, they've given up trying um, the possibilities that Western economic and political uh, models, uh, trying to implement uh, Western economic and political models because they haven't delivered, uh, even though they have tried to implement them, however, imperfectly. Uh, the, also, the other reason, one of the historical reasons, is to avenge past grievances, such as the Western powers drawing of artificial Arab state borders, foreign military attacks against Arabs, and, this, and I keep single, um, singling out Arabs because it really is an Arab issue. Um, of what is um, also, you know, what is perceived as the, hu the Israeli humiliation of Arabs and Arab regimes, dictatorial, brutal, and corrupt rule. And also there's the idea of experiencing daring adventures. Uh, these, are, these, are, these, these are young men, right? Um, so there is, and the appeal is also about, um, you know, some sort of heroism. 
Um, there are, so uh, scholars have tried to explain why it is that young men, that some of them married and with children, um, you know, join these groups. Um, many of these people have uh, grown up with war, occupation, and a general insecurity. Um, and um, uh, this is the generation of boys that came of age during the aftermath of the US invasion. They are the children of occupation, uh, whose fathers were either in jail or detainees. Um, um, they were either executed or fighting. Uh, they're not primarily fueled, although there is this idea, uh, you know, the religious ideology kind of plays into it, but they're not really fueled by the idea of an Islamic caliphate without borders. Um, ISIS, like Al-Qaeda before it, offers humiliated and angry young men a means to defend their dignity, um, their family, and their clan, as irrational as it might appear to us, because um, in joining ISIS, they're actually bringing on more bombs, as is, as is going to happen very, very soon, and is already happening. Um, at least they are not silent while being beaten. Um, and it's better to die fighting and with pride as Iraqi Sunni Arabs than to do nothing, to flee or wait for the coalition to strike. Uh, so there's a deep religious, cultural, um, and tribal identity here that gets touched in. In this way, I think they share a commonality with, uh, with the Taliban generation uh, who, um, you know, grew up under uh, years of uh, Soviet occupation, uh, living in the borderlands of Pakistan. Now we face the possibility that the U.S. Um, is, uh, is preparing to strike, um, uh, and the coalition is uh, increasing their, um, their military. Um, and so um, I almost, you know, have to conclude with the same uh, with the same assessment um, as before. Um, and hopefully, uh, people will, um, the powers will, um, will try and reach a political solution. Uh, but the future looks long and bloody. Thank you. Our third panelist is Janie Leatherman, Professor of Politics and International Studies. Okay, thank you. Um, well, it's a daunting task to follow up on the two previous presentations, but it does give me some context, so that's good. Um, I'm gonna focus more on the implications of what my colleagues have said uh, for the European context, and to a larger extent to, to the American context or the Western um, context as well. Um, what we see um, quite clearly in the news coverage of the outpouring of people from Syria, um, half of the population, some 11, 11 million people, um, either displaced within Syria or at least over 4 million displaced outside of Syria, um, as well as displacements from um, Iraq and exchange borders, uh, people moving fluidly across borders seeking safety and then not finding it where they fled and returning someplace else, um, not to mention people fleeing violence in Afghanistan and, and violence in, in, in other countries in the Middle East or in, in Africa. So there's literally a, a, a flood of humanity. That's the kind of terminology that the media would use um, that's moving. And the, the response of much of the West is simply to wall up and wall out. So that's how I want to frame this. But to put it in the context of this last week, um, in particular since the tragedies in Paris, and not to mention Beirut and um, Turkey and, and the, the, the Russian plane and so on, um, the, the, the fusing of the refugee with the image of ISIS, the, the, the conflating of a refugee as a, as a terrorist, as it were. So I'm gonna to try to briefly cover a number of broad kind of arguments here. Uh, first, I'm gonna ask the question, why are Western countries barricading themselves against the figure of a refugee as a terrorist? 
Um, and so I'm going to look briefly at this phenomenon of, of walling up. And I'm going to show you that this is just really not something happening in the West. It's actually a global phenomenon. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the links between um, patriarchy and male dominance, structures of, of, of authority um, linked to the state, to the nation state. But we could also um, talk about that in the context of, of religious authority as well. Um, and then we will talk about what are the disruptions to state or masculine control and um, the kinds of hegemonic response which we see, which I have summarized here as war and walls. Um, and then we'll briefly consider what could be some alternatives. Um, well, here's an image of Hungary's um, border barrier, which they erected very quickly as they were unable to uh, respond to the increased um, inflow of refugees across their borders this summer into early fall. And I think probably Hungary was one of the countries that received the most media attention in relation to this kind of situation and their quick response to simply uh, wall up and wall out. Um, but it's sim symbolic of, of a much broader trend. Um, so I have here for you a map, um, which if you can see is, is, is really aspiring to be a global um, view of the, the wide range of, of, of walling up and, and walling out that's going on across the world. So we're very familiar with what's happening in the American um, South, Southwest uh, with our border with Mexico. Um, but you can see it's also happening um, with Mexico and Guatemala, partly or much to the credit of US military strategy, um, but, but then also in, in, in South America and in South Africa against Zimbabwe and others. And in, in, in northern parts of, of, of Africa, in the Middle East, and much of the Middle East, the, the Saudis against the Yemen, the Yemenis, for example, um, the Ukrainians against the Russians, or the Baltic states against the Russians, or um, the, the Indians against the Bangladeshis, and, and on and on, it goes around the world. Uh, some scholars recently have estimated there are as many as 65 countries around the world that have created walls or fences against one or more neighbors of, of theirs. Um, and so here you see a, a closer picture of the situation um, in Europe. So it's worth, it's worth remembering you know, these images of these barriers um, because we're going to see shortly what are the routes that refugees are taking and you'll see how they're confronting these kinds of um, increasing um, obstacles. And then, um, just this last week, um, well, in the last couple of days, and even today, I guess the, the, the House adopted a resolution, um, uh, which is kind of our wall of words um, that we're erecting against um, receiving um, Syrian refugees to the United States. And indeed, our, our reception today has been um, paltry, would, would hardly um, even capture the, the, the minuscule kind of, of response. Um, I think we've, we've received less than 2,000 um, Syrians. And um, Obama is, President Obama is projecting we would receive as many as 10,000 over the next year. Um, but this is the, the rapid response now from so many states, over 30 um, in the US, against, um, against receiving refugees from Syria, uh, conflating them with um, ISIS terrorists. Um, so how is this possible? <laughs> Why, why do we have this kind of global phenomenon of walling up and walling out? So I thought one strategy to, or one approach to try to understand this is to look at the nation state in the context of um, nationhood and nationalism, um, which in the, in the event of war is often resurrected to, to epic proportions. And, um, and you see very quickly that the, the nationness of people is deeply linked to a reproduction, which has a lot to do with the sexual relations of men and women and how those uh, relations are controlled. And if you look very closely at what's happening in the areas of the Middle East, which are torn by war, um, you will see that sexual violence is pervasive. And indeed, having studied this topic and written a book about it, um, I can say that it's pervasive in most wars around the world. Uh, but Really, um, that kind of horrific violence that occurs in wartime is permissive, uh, per, more permissible, I would say, uh, facilitated uh, by the kinds of controls over reproduction and, and, um, and sexual violence in times of peace. And so you could say that, that the, 
the masculine control of society through the vehicle of the state um, occurs at multiple levels in countries around the world, in the household, um, in society, in the structures of the state, the state authorities, um, and into the international system itself. So it's only been in the last uh, 15 years uh, since the adoption, for example, of the International uh, Criminal Courts uh, Rome Treaty uh, that we have a provision in international law that finally uh, forbids the use of rape as a, wool, uh, as a, as a weapon of war or a tool uh, for genocide. Um, it, this is the 21st century. I mean, only now could we consider this um, an abomination. Um, so it's taken a long time for this kind of consideration to become part of the norms uh, in, in human rights standards um, in the international system. Um, and of course, it will take much longer to, to really give that kind of provision teeth and, and make, it, make it real in the lives of people on the ground in war zones around the world. Um, where they could actually get justice and go to a court system and find a judge and a, and a doctor and a lawyer and police and so on who would actually um, make it possible to enforce um, the kinds of laws that have been adopted. Uh, so you could say that sexual violence is, is a key mechanism of dominance at all levels of the system. And in a way, um, if you understand that the state has certain kind of historic functions around these notions of nationhood and belonging, and, and reproducing the nation, um, then the border itself um, is critical <laughs> because the border is the edge. <laughs> it's, it's a liminal space. It's where what's familiar ends and what's uncertain begins. Um, it's anxiety producing, you could say, um, from a national perspective. If you're trying to preserve the purity and the unity of your people vis-a-vis -vis others. Um, so, we see here in, in this illustration the construction of the, um, of the fence in Hungary. And I thought this photograph was particularly um, illustrative because it turns out that the, 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 the men who are constructing the border are prisoners. And that reminded me that, that the system of, of patriarchy um, depends on multiple forms of masculinity. And, and that includes allied masculine uh, ways of thinking, um, so masculine allies, you could say, um, as well as subordinate uh, masculinities. And uh, so certainly prisoners um, being forced to construct this wall here uh, would come under the category of subordinated masculinities. And, and we've heard fairly substantial account already tonight of the humiliated nature of the masculinities um, that are at stake in much of the Middle East. Um, and, and I can't help but think that that gives rise to uh, much of the violence uh, that we see, including um, the kind of sexual control and sexual violence that's, that's involved. Um, and, and so borders in this sense are, are edgy and anxiety producing. Um, and here, here's another image from um, Hungary, uh, which I labeled here uncomfortable gestures. Um, where the refugees are being gathered. And, and I thought, in particular, the police that, that are in the front row here um, look very uncomfortable with what they're doing. They're looking down and sort of, you know, their posture kind of gives away um, the, the extreme discomfort, it seems to me. So what are the kinds of disruptions and reassertions of masculine state control that are at play in global politics today that could help us understand from at least one perspective some of the things that are going on um, with respect to the violence uh, from ISIS and many other factions in, in the Middle East and the Western uh, militarized, very militarized response. Well, one thing we should take into account is globalization. And of course it has a long history. We tend to think that it started in 1980 or something like this, but you can follow that thread back a long ways. Um, a long ways indeed, how people have communicated with each other over, over millennia and centuries. Um, but there's, there's a more recent history here which is, which, which is critical and that's the history of imperialism. And so we see um, the kinds of grievances that that has uh, engendered in the region um, that contributes to the insecurities and, and to, the, to, the, to the anger that can fuel um, some of the, the mobilization that you see and the recruiting that you see um, that, that we've just talked about. Um, in addition, uh, with globalization, we have so many more points of connection around the globe than, than 
with technology and, and transportation and communication and so on. Um, so these points of connection also make us more vulnerable. Uh, so if we, were, if we were more isolated, there would be less means of leverage against us, I think. Um, and indeed, as, as I'll mention in a minute, with the ISIS strategy that's called the management of savagery, um, they really, they really used this to their benefit. Um, so, so that's a consideration, and I think that's also a part of the response um, to, to wall up and, and try to wall out. Um, also, we face unprecedented challenge, challenges. Um, I was really struck in the last year reading any number of international reports that the word unprecedented comes up over and over and over and over again. Everything is unprecedented. So what does that mean, really? To me, it means that the hegemonic system is in trouble. <laughs> and um, hegemony means that the top dog sets the rules, and everybody else goes along with them. So that means the system is very legible, right, to the top dogs. And the underdogs have to figure out how that system works so they can survive. Their survival depends on understanding that system even better than the people in the hegemonic state itself, I think. So um, this system seems to be... Um, really on some kind of precipice, I think. And that's also why um, I think borders seem to be edgy and very anxiety provoking today too. Um, and what, what, is, what, what are some of the elements of this unprecedentedness? Well, um, the number of, of refugees this last year hit almost 60 million. Um, Un unprecedented since World War II. We, we don't have figures like this. Um, and and the, the rapid increase of numbers of refugees from one year to the next, and the, the long-lasting nature of wars around the world, also unprecedented. We don't seem to have the capacity to get it together to set parties down at a table and say, work this out, right? I mean, and, and then what happens to the lives of the people who are torn apart by these conflicts? They live in limbo. They live in a liminal state. <laughs> they live somewhere on the edge um, for years, if not decades and decades. And, and, and the, the Congress, you know, being concerned or the governors being concerned that, oh, we will bring in, you know, the Syrian refugees like tomorrow. This will be a great concern. Um, in fact, um, it would take like a couple of years to vet each, each refugee. Um, at this rate, you can do the math. I mean, how long would it take us to accommodate you know, some substantial number of refugees from Syria. Um, so so the, the global response is, is so slow in response in, in relation to the, to the need, to the urgency of the moment. Um, and, and all this gives us a sense of unprecedented nature of challenges. And also, uh, m some of these conflicts are intertwined with climate change factors, including Syria and other areas, or Yemen and other areas in the Middle East. Um, and, and water shortages and crop failures and drought and Yemen had an unprecedented uh, uh, typhoon. Uh, typhoon. Yeah. yeah, unprecedented. I'm like, my God, in the middle of this conflict, there's like, we'll probably hear about this, there's like 1.4 million children severely malnourished mm -hmm. in Yemen. Mm -hmm. Like, who's talking about that? And on top of that, they get an unprecedented typhoon. Um, so the scope of the challenges are enormous. And um, besides that, then conflicts are in twined with uh, criminal enterprises and black marketing, as we've already heard from ISIS, the, the ISIS perspective. And um, so this, this makes it a really complicated kind of mess, right, to sort out. Um, and the response, the kind of the hegemonic projection, has been to launch what some scholars, uh, Derek Gregory in particular, has called the everywhere war. So war kind of is going on everywhere. And other scholars would say perpetual war. Um, it's, and, and I would say invisible war. I mean, invisible to us, not the people on the ground who are seeing the bombs hit them. But I've said to my students, like, when have you, when have you heard news about what places were bombing? Now we know the French are bombing, <laughs> but what about us? What are we doing? We don't know. And of course, we have people operating drones, and, and I've studied where they are and what they do, and they f can work very securely from remote locations and target other people. Well, we just targeted an al-Qaeda uh, ISIS person, right? One of the leaders. Um, occasionally, we hear something about this, uh, but for the most part, we have kind of invisible war for us, and that makes us too comfortable, and also, doesn't bring upon us a sense of responsibility either for what's going on. Um, 
And then we have walls, and some of them are very visible, and, and, and someone like Donald Trump would like to make them like way more visible <laughs> somehow, it seems, because it's not enough to have a wall along the border with Mexico that in many places is three layers deep. Um, so he envisions something even more, more dramatic. Um, so this is a kind of a hyper-masculinity you know, that we see as, as the, the response to the, the sense of insecurity vis-a-vis uh, -vis these kinds of challenges to hegemony. Well, so ISIS then has you know, a plan that, that you can read this online. I, I would caution you to be careful where you download stuff that has anything to do with ISIS, really, I mean, because they may come you know, to try to recruit you. Uh, I'm totally serious about this. So I was very careful. I downloaded it from a site from Harvard. Um, but this handbook is, is somewhat chilling. And, and, and it, it explains in there about how this is a, like more than a 10-year-old document, but it seems to inspire some of the ISIS approach. Um, that you know, you would go after oil, you would go after the media, um, you would um, try to to vex you know the enemy as it were. So operations of vexation, and you would target the enemy in all kinds of different places. So what I was saying about tourism, for example, we're all over the place with tourists. That makes, makes us extremely vulnerable. So they can spread out our focus all over the planet. You know, responding to attacks on our tourists. Just one simple strategy, right? Um, so, so that's part of you know the disruptions uh, that we're we're seeing, um, and in the context of all that, then this kind of uh, refugee flow. Um, so, a few quick slides then to give you a sense of what's going on there. Um, here's here's a picture of of what's happening in Europe in terms of asylum claims this year. Um, you see, Germany has the most, but you can also see Hungary is quite prominent um, in, in in this context. Um, and actually, I have a friend who works in, in the state in Germany that has the highest percentage of, of, of refugees being resettled there in, in Baden-Württemberg, which is like 21%. Um, and here you can see that in proportion to the population, actually Hungary is like way outpaced everybody else. So maybe it's not as surprising then that Hungary was like so desperate to take measures. Um, but the, the Hungarian um, authorities you know, themselves felt humiliated by the failure of the European Union to come to their aid. So again, a kind of, uh, of, of masculine humiliation that they responded to with a type of hyper-masculine response um, through walling up and trying to wall out. Um, yeah, and here's where most of the people are coming from. So you can see Syria is in the lead, but followed by Afghanistan and, well, Kosovo. So even the persisting problems of the Balkans are echoing in Europe still today. Here are the eastern routes uh, that people have used to flee through mostly smuggling operations at great risk. Um, and then what probably most people don't know about is the northern route, uh, which is through Russia and then into, um, into Norway. And that entry point is by bicycle because the Norwegians um, required that you cross the border on, on some mode of transportation. You can't go across by foot uh, from Russia. And when they get on the Norwegian side, they have to abandon their bicycles because they don't meet the safety standards of Norway. And so a company has been hired to come and, and collect the tons and tons of bicycles uh, that have been abandoned at this crossing point uh, to apparently recycle them for reasons that they're not quite sure. <laughs> Um, so instead of life jackets, it's bicycles. Here is the Mediterranean Sea route, and as you see from many different points as well, and the number of deaths. So already in 2015, uh, the date, I'm not sure if I put the date up on this slide, um, well, uh, up to November, uh, so up to about now, um, already exceeding the number of 2014 despite concerted efforts to save lives, more concerted efforts than there had been in place before. So I'm going to end uh, in, a, in a way that's, that's a bit provocative, perhaps. Um, I find it painful to show this image. I, I couldn't bring myself to even look at it when it was first published. Uh, but I think we should feel pain, because we don't. Uh, because we, the war is invisible to us. So I thought we should feel pain. We should know what pain feels like. Um, to have a sense of responsibility. How can we have a sense of 
of shame about what's happening in the world and we're not doing enough if we don't have any, any pain about it. Uh, so this, this photograph to me engenders a lot of pain. Uh, but I also thought that it speaks a lot to the anxiety provoking and edginess of borders. This is a very liminal situation. That this child is so close and yet so far, you know. And, and what could have been done, right, to save this life? And, and this, this, this image resonated around the world um, again and again in, in all kinds of communities it spoke to. So you know that there's something very powerful about, about this image. Um, what does it tell us about our failures or responsibilities? Or who is bearing witness in this photo? If you see it and you think about it and you do something, are you bearing witness? And what does that mean? Um, does, it, does it take us to some kind of action? So um, just, just to, to, to end here on a, on a, on a better note, um, there are many people across, uh, across Europe um, who've, who've stepped up, right? Like a friend of mine in Germany who's working for the government. Um, but, but civilians, you know, who, who stood out on the streets and passed out water, broke up their day and said, I'll go buy water because these people need water. Or somebody said, here's a, here's a disabled person, I'll take them in my car. Um, and, and, and here in, in Budapest, in the train station underneath, um, somebody figured out a way to show um, Tom and Jerry cartoons <laughs> to entertain the children. And I thought, well, that's brilliant, right? I mean... Um, to take them out of their suffering, their anguish, their anxiety, um, their pain, and, and, and give them a moment to be a child. I mean, what could be more powerful and important than that? Um, so I think that should, those gestures that the Europeans took should, should inspire us to think about what is our accountability, what is our responsibility? How could we exercise an ethic of care as opposed to resorting kind of automatically to a militarization uh, of, of response as, as, as our first line of, of thinking, <laughs> right? Um, and, and so I think that's probably a good segue to, to, to our next speaker. We'll yeah, talk about children. Our fourth panelist is David McFadden, professor oh, of history. I'm going to leave that Janie slide up there because it's, uh, in a way, it's a good segue to what I'm going to be talking about. And you may think, oh, that's not so. You're going to be talking about Russia. Russia is one of the problems in this situation. And I guess I beg to differ with that. Um, and I want to remind you of some of the same statistics that other people have mentioned because Everybody in this room should rivet them in their mind. Half of Syria's population, nearly 12 million people, have been displaced. 300,000 dead. Four million have fled the country. Now, we quite rightly get upset when 129 die in Paris when 224 die in an airliner from Egypt, when a number of people die in Beirut and elsewhere. This humanitarian crisis in Syria is the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II, exceeding all of the genocides individually, of the 90s. And yet, it remains invisible. Now, I submit that the best way to reduce the refugee crisis, to isolate ISIS, and bring the, the world and Syria back from the brink of wider war, is to double down on the diplomacy. In order to do that, we have to involve Russia and Iran, especially Russia. First, we can work with Russia and the rest of the international community to relieve the suffering of the refugees. Funding needs to be tremendously increased, and more countries, not fewer, need to be persuaded to increase the number of refugees they will accept. Most observers have pointed out the U.S. could accept 100,000, 
not just 10,000. Secondly, and most importantly, we and the Russians need to put pressure on our allies publicly. There is no military solution to the conflict in Syria. None. Military, increased military action, which both the Russians and the French and the Americans are engaged in, only impedes the progress toward a diplomatic solution. Because the two sides of the conflict, and I talk here about the US and its allies, the Saudis, Jordan, the Gulf states, Turkey, and Russia and its allies, Iran, Hezbollah, and the Syrian government, those, those allies, the only way for the conflict to be settled is to get those parties together. The various rebel forces and Syrian opposition groups, Hezbollah, the Syrian government, and Iran, Turkey, and the Gulf states. Now, there are negotiations going on in Vienna right now. There's even talk that there may be uh, a 15-day, that's not enough, a short-term ceasefire that is imminent. We can only hope that this is true. Now, this has been tried before, of course. There was a Geneva communique in 2012 that involved the UN and uh, uh, former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. That collapsed. The Geneva Conference of 2014 collapsed. The major sticking point seems to be that the US is demanding that Assad leave and Russia is uh, refusing to force that outcome. Russia has pointed out, and I might uh, mention this to everyone, that the two famous times in the last 10 years that the US and its allies forced a dictator out in Iraq and Libya resulted in bad outcomes, resulted in chaos, resulted in the recruitment of more Islamic terrorists. Um, but the gap between the Russia and the US has to be bridged. And in order to do that, you got to spend time doing it. Uh, I was very heartened to read that after the recent meetings between uh, Secretary of State John Kerry and Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov of Russia, uh, Kerry went away from those meetings saying that Russia uh, played a very positive role and that uh, he, was, he was hopeful. The current idea seems to be ceasefire, Syria-wide, and especially in the uh, number of local ceasefires, um, cooperation among uh, the Syrian government, Hezbollah, and others uh, to reduce the uh, recruitment of um, of militias and, and terrorists and, and extremists, and an arms embargo. Now, we're the furthest thing from an arms embargo now. We're going the other way. And I think the key is really the US needs to commit itself to a serious working relationship with Russia. Russia has a long history with Syria. Russia has been involved in Syria since the 19th century. And uh, Russia recognized, was one of the first countries to recognize um, the uh, independent govern government of Syria uh, after decolonization uh, in the 1940s. Uh, Russia has been committed to the Assad regime for years. Russia has a naval base on the Mediterranean and is the major supplier of the uh, of military equipment uh, to Assad. But I think if, if the US and Russia can agree, they can press their, their allies to do the same. You may wonder, well, now, why is Russia interested in this? Well, I think the strategic uh, position is clear. And we also forget that 14% of the Russian population 
18 million people are Sunni Muslims. Uh, they recently opened a new mosque, a magnificent mosque in Moscow. And Russia has uh, fought their own battles against uh, Islamic militants uh, in the southern parts of Russia. Russia is open to a unity government and to elections. And I think the only way Assad will agree is if uh, Russia agrees. And I think Iran uh, will go along with that. So um, I'd just like to turn from Russia uh, briefly here to uh, a couple of other uh, notes. There was a major report on BBC the other day that the only hope for a solution in Syria uh, runs through Moscow. And um, I think, and I'm very worried about the attitude uh, of many people in the United States against the refugees and calling for more uh, military assistance down that road is going to be further disaster in Syria. And now I'd like to hear about the children. Do you have the slides up? So I'm Wendy Christian, and I'm with Save the Children, as they mentioned. And our objective, our goal, is to make sure every child has a healthy start, an opportunity to learn, and protection from harm here in the United States and in 122 countries around the world. So we have been involved in helping the children and families affected by the conflict in Syria, the war in Syria. Uh, since it began almost five years ago inside Syria and in the bordering countries of Lebanon and Jordan and Turkey. And then this year, of course, have really ramped up our efforts as we're responding to these families virtually on the run who are fleeing across Europe. And we've deployed teams and have country offices in Italy and Greece, Macedonia, Serbia, and Germany. And so I thought at this point, after you've heard about this very politically charged situation and you've learned about the history, it should be my job to really put the face on this situation, and especially the child's face. Because we know that in any conflict, it is always the child who is the most vulnerable, the greatest victim, who has the most to lose. They're not political, and yet they're the ones who suffer the most. And so I wanted to take you kind of through a journey through the eyes of a child who's making that journey, who's fleeing Syria right now. And I'll tell you that after this, you can go to our website, savethechildren.org. I took some of the photos from there, but there's an interactive photo essay that you can see where we had a journalist follow a family from across the desert of Turkey and all the way to a refugee camp in Germany, and you can see that there. We also have a virtual reality video there that you can download the app, the Riot app, on your phones and watch that. It's a two-minute video that, again, takes you right through the eyes of that refugee child. So. I think we get more understanding, more empathy, in a situation when it becomes closer to us, and we can see it that way. So here's a refugee boy who has just come off this dinghy. My uh, group there on the Isle of Lesbos uh, saw this dinghy coming up as they were driving along the highway. They ran down to the rocky coast there and helped people coming off the dinghy. This is as you know, one of many, many that are arriving on some of the busiest days, 22 of these rubber boats are arriving there on the coastline packed with people, elderly, children, babies. This little boy's mother was coming off the raft and she was holding a two-month-old infant in her arms. And she was limping as our team helped her get off. In the crush, her ankle had been broken. So here's a mom with a two-month-old infant, a toddler, a broken ankle. And I just hear that story and think, how bad must it be that a mother will get on that terribly unsafe journey? 
knowing she might not make it. We know many don't. You just saw the bodies there washing up. And that seems like the best choice, the safest route for her children. How bad must it be? But if they make it across the water and our groups are there to give them some temporary housing there, dry clothes, blankets, dry them off, um, they are just at the start of their journey. They have a long way to go. And from this point, they are walking miles. They are waiting on crowded train platforms, hoping that they can get on a train, many of which have no bathrooms. By now, all the food and water they've brought with them have been depleted. And if they make it that far, they get to the border and hope that they get across, and many of them are turned away, even after that journey. And if they get across, that's where we have teams of people who are helping them, not just Save the Children staff members. These are volunteers here in Serbia, people in the country. So you keep hearing about countries closing down and not helping. So many volunteers are there and being generous and trying to help those families who are fleeing, who are on the run. Here they're giving them food and water. We distribute hygiene kits so they can try to keep their families clean and healthy. And then the real waiting begins. They're waiting here to get their registration, to be declared refugees, to see if they can go on to the refugee camps in Germany. That's their final kind of dream in this particular journey. And this is where we see a lot of the children really break down because they kind of can gather all their little energy and resources to make it through that harrowing journey. But when they get here, they just don't know how long they're waiting or what's going to happen next. There's so much uncertainty. And that's where we're seeing the kids kind of break down and crying. Um, they have to be there for hours and days. And if they have to spend the night there in shelters like this, in giant warehouses uh, with army cots, certainly no place for an infant or a toddler. And so Save the Children maps out what we call child-friendly spaces, safe spaces. We use kind of police tape to have a little area where we've got trained staff who can protect them. Parents can trust that their kids will be safe there. They're read to. Uh, a lot of the difficult, traumatic situations that they've been through come out through their art and drawing, through music. They can play, have a semblance of a childhood uh, in the midst of this chaos. Um, that's all we can really offer them at that point while they wait. And the lucky ones get to crowd on this bus, this bus that's going to take them to the refugee camp in Germany. But when they get there, as we know, and as we're hearing even more this week, their fate is really still so uncertain. They have no idea if a country will open its doors to them and let them resettle and rebuild and start a new life in safety for their family. One 10-year-old boy who met our CEO, Carolyn Miles, in Greece, she asked him, what do you want when you get to Germany? What are you looking for most? And he said, I just want to have a place that's safe. I would really like to be able to play outside again. I haven't played outside in three years. And when you hear those kinds of stories from a 10-year-old and you see that the effort these parents are going through to try to give them that, that safe life, it's hard to imagine that this might be the end, that they might not get an opportunity to rebuild in a, in a new country. And I think when we see what's happening in the house today and in social media as people are trying to kind of process what's going on, and they have so many concerns and so much fear. Sometimes it helps to take a couple of steps back to get perspective. So I wanted to end with a story of one more refugee, not from Syria, but from a crisis that was happening when I first started at Save the Children. In 92, probably when many of you were just uh, right before you were even born. And this is Isla. She's a refugee, as I said, not from Syria, but in Bosnia, another country very different than what's going on in Syria, and yet so many things the same. A country divided by ethnic uh, differences and different religions. And Isla, as the daughter of a Bosnian Serb mother and a Bosnian Muslim father, was targeted uh, for the genocide there, the ethnic cleansing, as it was called. Her family uh, fled in the middle of the night, as many Syrian families are. They ran to the border of Croatia and were turned back as many families today are being. 
It was just a UN commission that took some of these targeted children in a special convoy that got them across the border where they waited on a train platform for days and weeks to be able to go to a refugee camp in Germany. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? They did get to that refugee camp. Isla arrived in a, uh, got to a barracks. It was a former military training center there in Germany. A giant barracks with lots of bunk beds and one shared bathroom. And Isla's family and 14 other families went into that barracks. And they shared that barracks, those bunk beds, that one bathroom together for three years. And during that three year time, she became a teenager. That was her middle school time. And they had no idea if they were going to get uh, the opportunity to rebuild their life in another country. And one day they got the big news that they were going to Cleveland. And so they got to go to Cleveland, Ohio. Isla went to high school there. She had about three words of English when she started. Imagine being 15 and starting in high school with just a handful of words. I tell her that it helps that she looks something like a supermodel, but uh, still, she had to work really hard. Finished high school, finished uh, with a scholarship at Ohio University, went on to grad school at NYU, got her degree in journalism, became a journalist in New York, got married there and decided it was time to use her skills to give back. And that's when she joined my team. Mm -hmm. And that's when she started working at Save the Children with me. And you know, Isla's been there for five years and the first three years she's worked at Save the Children, she really insisted that she work in our US programs, that she work for kids living in some of the worst impoverished areas in Appalachia and the Mississippi Delta because she wanted to give back to kids who were struggling in her newly adopted country. And then we trained her to go on to some of the biggest disasters. Here she's in the Philippines right after Typhoon Haiyan hit. Wherever kids were suffering, Isla was there to help them. She has a baby now. She and her husband live right here in Fairfield County. They work right here in Fairfield. This is the face of a refugee. When it sounds like it's somebody far away, it might be your neighbor. It might be someone who's contributing in this way. This week, Isla had her dream fulfilled, a dream that began when she was in those barracks, in that barracks in Germany. She got a job offer and took it to work at the United Nations in the same division that saved her life 23 years ago. And that's what can happen in America, isn't it? A young child can come here as a refugee with just nothing but a dream, and we give an opportunity to that child, and look what she can do. Isla's story inspires me, and it makes me think, what could this child do if we give her that opportunity? Thank you. Thank you so much to all of the panelists. We will now be taking questions. So just raise your hand if you have a question, and we'll come around with our microphone. Any questions? So I have a question. Um, with the Paris attack, I heard like most people think that that was like a bad move for ISIS. So, like, what is the what, is, what will happen with ISIS right now? Because like, it's in the eye of the world. Um, right now, Russia is, is talking with um, United States and unified and fight ISIS. So, what is the future of ISIS and Syria overall? I guess that's for me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> nice so, if I could peer into the crystal ball, so there's a paradox here. Uh, because on the one hand, the predicted response, as you've already seen, is going to be increased bombing. They've already gone to Raqqa. Uh, planes have left uh, France, um, and you know some of the planes have uh, some of the missiles have uh, from Paris with love uh, written on them. Um, and on the one hand, you're going to be, they're going to be able to kill some. Um, you know, some ISIS members, but the more that they bomb, because these are not smart bombs, these bombs are gonna kill innocent people. 
Um, the more that they do, the more it feeds the ideology of, of being attacked by a group of um, you know, imperial powers, uh, bigger powers. And um, unfortunately, it's going to create a bigger recruiting ground. I mean, one of the most powerful, and I've told this in my classes too, one of the most powerful images that I have, um, because I watch Arab TV all the time, um, two weeks before, uh, well, two weeks before the Russian plane went down, um, when the Russians were bombing, um, you know, that. Um, supposedly ISIS targets, uh, one of the bombs fell on an elementary school. And Al Jazeera broadcast uh, images of parents searching through the rubble, and one particular man with this little plastic grocery bag looking for the pieces of his child uh, after the bombing. So that broadcast to 40 million viewers in the Arab world is a powerful image. Um, of what can happen to the innocent. So it's a paradox. On the one hand, you can get the, you know, 100, you know, or so terrorists, but you also pay a price um, in, in recruiting. That's, this is why I think all of us, uh, strangely enough, are in agreement that the military solution is not going to bring a solution. If I could add one thing, the other really, really sad thing, you know, another part of the U.S. response is closing the borders and not receiving refugees and thinking that refugees are ISIS. Mm. And that kind of response from the United States and Europe is also recruiting for ISIS because all they, they can just say, look, you shouldn't go to Europe, you shouldn't go to the West, look what, they don't want you, we're your, we're your salvation. And we, we've seen the situation in Iraq, Libya, Yemen, and now Syria, when the destruction of the, uh, of the state, the inability of, uh, of the civil fabric to, to stay, is creating more ISIS. You cannot destroy ISIS that way. You know, President Obama had a good idea a couple of years ago. It's got lost, the Republicans have pummeled it. It's probably dead which is the major response we have to have to ISIS is ideological. We have to deal with poverty. Mm -hmm. We have to deal with education. We have to work with the moderate, moderate Muslim communities to transform that image. And if we're not welcoming to refugees and the Muslim world, it's just going to, you know, it's just bad policy. It's just going to make it worse. We have time for probably one more question. Any comments? Um, so I just have a question that I wrote down um, during, like throughout the presentation, and it was regarding what we as individuals can be doing um, to make a change in the next week, uh, in the next uh, weeks, months, years, I don't, I don't like today. Because <laughs> um, it seems as if the government, you know, has always been making the decisions, and that seems like the military is going to be the answer. Um, and if we want to make a change, how is that going to you know, come about? A lot of people say social media, um, protests, rallies, but you know, they always seem very superficial. And I don't know what your recommendations are for moving forward. I think that you know, one clear approach at the moment is to speak to our representatives in government and if you feel that we should be welcoming um, to refugees, then send that message. I think um, it's, a, it's a really critical time to uh, use your voice in those ways. Um, of course, we can support Save the Children and other organizations um, that are working on the ground. Um, and you can make your own choices in your own lives, how, how you want to commit yourself, um, either professionally or through your own vocation, um, to support you know, refugee calls and, and peacemaking, human rights uh, kinds of causes, social justice causes um, in your own communities, not to mention internationally. So uh, there's an international institute in Connecticut that always need uh, resources for resettled refugees. Sometimes we can place students there as interns or in service learning projects. And there's another program in Stanford um, that, that also does similar kinds of work with immigrants. Um, 
So that there's, I think, opportunities in our own in our own community that we can we can um, easily um, live our commitments, um, as well as look for other opportunities uh, internationally. And by the way, Janie was going to mention this, but I'll oh, mention yes. it. Thank you. We have a new humanitarian action minor at Fairfield University that was just approved by the Academic Council. I want that to be as big as the health sciences. I love health sciences, but <laughs> we need to make that a really powerful minor. And students need to step up, uh, declare that minor, come see <coughs> Professor Leatherman, uh, take the courses that are offered, and get involved with Juhan, hmm. and make this campus a, a force in the community uh, for humanitarian issues. Yeah, I should say we'll have more information about the minor. Um, public and probably a week's time at the most, it looks like. Um, so we're, we're excited to go on with that. But Juhan is, 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 you know, right ready for you today, so, yeah. Um, I was just reminded, um, I had a conversation with the Fairfield faculty member that not that long ago, and she told me that um, her uh, plans this summer were to travel to Italy with her kids and her husband and work with refugees in the camps in Italy. So for those of you who are thinking about the grand European tour, you could maybe uh, stay in one location and invest those funds in hanging around one particular location in Italy, Germany, Sweden, take your pick, uh, and uh, helping you know, work with, uh, with refugees or with kids, playing with them. And we would love your support, but also to, again, go to savethechildren.org and download the video, share it with people. We really think that uh, getting that information is really important to building the understanding. And when people are informed and aware of what's going on, we know that the United States is the most generous country in the world. And I think just to bring it down to the personal level, never underestimate the power of a conversation. Um, especially when you are informed and you seek knowledge, um, like you're doing here. You're, you're, you are trying to get a different perspective. That's why you're here. So have your conversations with the people you know. You are in a privileged situation. You are college students um, or you know, uh, are in influential positions. Have those conversations with people in your circle because that transforms perspectives and really, there, the power of you know how we how we structure a situation, how we view a situation, um, you can't underestimate that, and how you transmit it in social media. Although uh, you know you may say that it's superficial, but truly, social media uh, has uh, re refocused. Um, you know, you would not have heard about the Beirut um, uh, omission uh, had it not been for one person who protested on social media. One person can really, really make a difference. Um, and you have so many, so many tools at your disposal. Um, so use them. Um, use your knowledge and use your curiosity and, and, and keep learning. Oh, and there's a really cool site called D-I-M-E-O. Um, it's, uh, you want to talk about it? It's, it's these uh, guys who are actually on the ground and they're going around and sort of secretly uh, having conversations with people. Uh, in everyday life, and they post them. They're short. They're really short, and uh, it's uh, it's really interesting. Also, if you want to learn a little bit more about, um, and I know I've shared this with my classes, um, Al Jazeera has a great website, interactive website of um, what life is like for refugees. It's called Life on Hold, um, and you'll see profiles of different refugees in Lebanon and their lives, and you'll see, um, you know, a lot of it is breaking down the stereotypes. We are closing the walls because we have stereotypes. Um, so a lot of it is, you know, um, break down those walls. Um. You know, I just, uh, th this has come up before, but I think it's a good time with all of you here to mention this. I think Fairfield University should make a public statement and should reach out to sponsor uh, some students, some Syrian students, to come to Fairfield. And I don't see why we can't make that happen. And with Juhan and with the Center for Faith and Public Life, I think that would be a tremendous statement at this time mm -hmm. to take an initiative in that direction. 
Yeah. You think we can do yeah, that? Yeah, I've said the same thing. I agree. Yeah, that we need to put our efforts together. Yeah, and let's do student it. voices are extremely important on initiatives like this. Um, you, you don't underestimate the, the power of your voice. Right. Yes. And my, my challenge to the Juhan students was like, reach out to the other, other Jesuit university campuses. And I don't know if you had a chance to do that in Washington, but um, you, know, you can imagine that an idea can, can, can grow and flourish and um, we can shoulder some of the, the responsibility and get ourselves. those campuses in those states that have said they're gonna reject refugees to, to raise holy hell there. We've got a great state <laughs> here in Connecticut. You should thank Governor Malloy, you should thank uh, Senator Murphy and Senator uh, Blumenthal and our Congressman Jim Himes. Himes. They're yeah. all on the right side of this, but they're under tremendous pressure. Yeah. Well, two quick notes before we um, close for tonight. If you are interested in using your student voice to help those in need stand in solidarity, and contribute towards humanitarian action, please come see me and Carrie. We can talk to you about the Juhan Student Group. We meet every other Wednesday at seven. And finally, if you are a first year, there is a laptop in the back just, and if you're looking for FYE credit, all the way in the back next to the pink bag, uh, just put down your name and your ID number. But once again, thank you so much thank to you. our panelists. Thank you to everyone for coming.